Thanks, Louis. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our panel. Uh, let me kick off by introducing uh, everyone on the panel today. First off, uh, Laura Quigley, the Senior Vice President for APAC at Integral Ad Science, joining us all the way from New Zealand. Uh, we have Matt Harty, the Senior Vice <laughs> President Asia at the Trade Desk. And we have John Muskelly, the APAC Investment Director at Group M. Thanks very much, uh, all panelists, for joining us today. So a great bit of uh, experience here. We should really get into some uh, good meaty subjects today. Uh, let me start off, I think it's always good with these panels uh, to start off sometimes with definitions to sort of steer us in the right direction. Um, and uh, let's talk about what we actually mean by OTT. And uh, perhaps I'll throw this question to you, uh, Matt, to start off with and how your organization defines OTT. Well, I, I, OTT is, is a description of over the top and it's services that are provided over the top of the existing TV, which was terrestrial television and cable television. So for us, that's streaming television services, and those could be ones that are under a subscription model, like something like a Netflix or something that's on an advertising model, something more like an iFlex. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, a number of us on the AVIA panel, one of the, uh, sorry, on the uh, AVIA committees, one of the things we are busy working through at the moment is um, around the definition of premium video, and I think... Louis uh, alluded to it just a little earlier at the intro. So I'm interested in how organizations make this distinction between premium curated rights-owned content and then what could be termed non-premium, which could be uh, UGC video. And uh, John, perhaps from a sort of Group M perspective, interested in how you uh, define or differentiate between these two bits of content. I guess, Jason, we would call premium content professionally produced content. A simple definition of what we would what we would call it. And your question around do we distinguish <coughs> between professionally produced content and uh, non-professionally produced content, is the answer is really yes and no. We're in the business of delivering outcomes for our client. So ir irrespective of the content cost of the editorial, we want to deliver an outcome. But intuitively, it feels that it's better to be in Game of Thrones and doggy on skateboards. <laughs> OK, fair enough. And assume there's a little bit of a premium sometimes attached with those different environments as well. Yeah, but it all, it, we're all trying to be delivering better outcomes for the, yeah. for the advertiser. Um, yeah. That's key for us, not the cost of the content. Yeah, okay, good point, yeah. Um, so now, the size of the uh, OTT opportunity um, when we think about Southeast Asia and India. Um, you know, question, hard to come by some of these data points sometimes, so perhaps I guess through the experience that we have here on the panel, uh, wondering if uh, one of you want to have a go perhaps at having a you know, little bit of a think about what you think the size of the market looks like for OTT in Southeast Asia and India? Okay, I'll give it a, I'll give it a, I'll give it a whirl. Uh, so, like most studies that I see, I don't think that o professionally produced content drives more than five to six points of incremental reach on a broadcast TV schedule. Now, that obviously will differ from clients, so some clients have younger audiences where the incremental reach is probably a bit higher. So I would say, like, of the total television market, I would say OTT probably represents five to 10% opportunity of the total broadcast budget. But you have to remember there's markets like India, Indonesia, where broadcast TV is still billions of dollar industry. So like people may think that five to ten percent doesn't sound that much, but in the context of um, the overall share of television, it's probably a significant amount. And if you add all the markets together, I reckon it probably comes to somewhere between a seven hundred and a billion dollar opportunity just based on the what we think is five to ten percent of the T V market. All right. Would you say if we look at uh, Australia or China, if we look just outside of Southeast Asia, um, do you think the, it's similar numbers there, if you just had to take a guess? I'd say Australia is quite similar, whilst there is a little bit of a decline in the linear audiences. It's still the dominant, um, broadcast TV is still a pretty dominant channel. Mm. Um, but we do see CTV growing in Australia, but I still think that it's a 5 to 10% incremental reach you get from BVOD. I think China's completely different box of frogs. Um, I know that broadcast, type, broadcast TV um, is pr probably less than 10% of the media schedule at the minute, so China's very, very different. All right. Okay. Does that have something to do with how difficult it is to plan TV in China with so many different places that you would have to, to, to place ads? I just think there's a whole plethora of OTT 
providers that are able to deliver in Kamal and reach that broadcast TV ne can't necessarily do in China. All right. I wonder if there's also a big gap between, um, you know, mobile suffered for many years with this huge uh, usage, but the money really lagging. Do we think that's happening around OTT at the moment? I mean, uh, certainly during COVID, usage has been spiking hugely, but perhaps the money hasn't. Do you think, uh, I don't know, Matt, do you have a view on that? Time spent versus money spent? Well, I mean, I anybody who's spent their career working in, in digital has, has, has worked with this big problem between the amount of time spent versus the amount of money spent in, in different areas. And certainly when it came to print media, um, <clears throat> the markets, particularly in Southeast Asia, were, were very, very slow to start to correct um, the, the time spent versus money spent. Um, I think that probably you know, one of the what, what John's talking about is in terms of how much incremental reach is being offered is probably the thing slowing down. But the research that I've seen for um, uh, for, for streaming television services is they they're eating <coughs> into the amount of time spent um, on the linear TV um, uh, platforms, and you know, they're eating into it considerably, in, in to the point that it's the the research suggests that it's around a third of time spent. Um, with television is now in streaming services, but yeah, that's going to have to translate in a, in a real value reach situation for that uh, for that money to be able to pour across. Yeah, yeah, I think in uh, digital we felt uh, very underrepresented in the last couple of years in the sense mobile so much time spent, so little money. Sort of similar thing happening perhaps now with OTT with a lot of time spent and then not quite as much money flowing through. But uh, let's hope that'll be following shortly. Alrighty, uh, let's change on to a couple of uh, challenges um, inherent to OTT. Unfortunately, there are a couple of those. Um, so, uh, you know, to this point, I said there's perhaps some challenges that are preventing uh, investment of going into this channel. Uh, and one area I'd like to start with is um, around measurement. Uh, Laura, obviously something uh, very close to your heart, I know. Um, maybe we want to get your views on around measurement and some of the challenges uh, perhaps uh, that are presented to us around OTT. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll kick off by also just recently, every, every company likes to do a little bit of research and we did the same. And so around kind of OTT, we basically found that a lot of the brands and agencies were saying they would invest more um, if they could get kind of a 66% improvement in metrics. So there was a lack of uh, brands and agencies feeling like there was enough measurement metrics. So I'll call out a couple of areas that I think uh, we probably need to work on and some challenges uh, in the space. So the first is cross-device measurement. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, obviously online, we've got cookies. Uh, with mobile, uh, we don't. We have what we call device IDs. And so really tracking that audience across multiple different platforms gets a little bit trickier. Um, and it means that potentially we're getting this oversaturation. And, and in some cases, I guess, frequency capping is not applied. So we're showing multiple ads to the same user. What I will say, though, I guess to, to, to answer the challenge, um, in that case, there are multiple companies that are doing their own thing. There's also the IAB. They've got something called the DigiTrust ID that they're working on. So this is being taken into consideration, but cross-device measurement uh, is definitely a, a challenge. Um, another two that I'll raise is VAST. So there's VAST and VPAID inventory. If we look at something like CTV, uh, there's a lot of vast inventory, majority vast inventory. Uh, and that poses a challenge for, for measurement capabilities, for getting really rich um, reporting capabilities. Um, and so that means uh, that as an inter industry, we need to come together and I guess look to the next iteration of, of vast or VPAID. Um, the last thing that I'll raise, and John might be able to add a bit of color to this, is simply around what does success look like when it comes to this. Um, and so we hear a lot of our, our agencies and brands talking about is video views the right metric, maybe time and views the right metric. Uh, but traditionally, digital has been based on impressions and performance. And so I guess perhaps there's a challenge, but an opportunity for the industry to come together to work out what is that, uh, that metric or that measurement uh, to define success for this particular medium that we're talking about today. So yeah, a couple of challenges that we need to overcome, but nothing impossible. All right, good to hear. John, your, your, your view, you want to add to that? Yeah, I like, uh, some of the challenges are probably psychological in the sense that I think digital, <laughs> we're, we're guilty of over-measuring stuff. I mean, to quote Rob Norman, one of my favorite people, digital is very, uh, very countable, but not very accountable. Um, and we, we want to measure everything, but sometimes it's okay just to measure things like impressions. So I think if you're, if you're buying an I.O. from 
direct from iFlex, from View, from Line, from Channel 9. I think it's safe to say that that's viewable. I think it's safe to say that it's probably not fraudulent. I think it's safe to say that it's probably brand safe. And But we still want to measure these things. And I think sometimes... Like a TV is a great industry whereby we measure reach and frequency. We use a single source panel like Nielsen or Kantar. And as imperfect as it might be, it's still a single source of truth that everyone's happy with. But in digital, we're a little bit guilty of over measuring stuff. So I think some of the challenges could be more our own behaviors than actual technical challenges. Right, interesting. Maybe so maybe nice some behavioral things to, to overcome here. Yep. Matt, anything to add there or around challenges at all? Um, I, I think that it's been very well covered. Yeah, there's more than enough there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Alrighty, uh, let's talk a little bit about this uh, last couple of months that have been going through with COVID. Uh, obviously, a huge amount of media coverage, uh, massive changes uh, in consumer behavior, and uh, I think it's going to be fascinating, actually, uh, in um, a year or two, looking back, uh, I'm, I'm interested myself in uh, how many of these changes would have continued on. Uh, but uh, now that we're sort of stuck right in the middle of it, let's uh, have a quick discussion about uh, the changes in consumer behavior. Uh, you know, what are the advertising trends that are coming out of this, for example? Uh, Laura, perhaps I can uh, kick off with you and have a little bit of a chat about your views on changes in consumer behavior as a result of COVID. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess uh, I guess to start off with, we only have to look at our own behavior to, to know that it's increased, right? So mm. I know today we're talking about Avod, but you know, every virtual call I'm on, we're talking about Tiger King and we're, or people are talking about bread making and then watching YouTube videos on bread making. So it's only obvious that the consumption in the space has absolutely increased because of COVID. Um, also, you know, we're seeing things like we can't go to the cinema anymore. We can't have concerts. So all of those things that we've mean that we've got a shift in consumer behavior. Um, and most of what we've seen is that, uh, particularly in China um, and in the Philippines, we're seeing this real increase or huge increase in our data in terms of people streaming, watching shows and films. Um, as a contrary to that, when we look at media consumption, we can see that over the time, media consumption increased on newspapers at only 14%, where it was something like 50, 60% with streaming videos. So it's obvious it's gone up. Um, the other thing I will add is I think we all know that it takes only, they say, 30 days to uh, to make a habit. Um, and so it's likely that I guess we'll see this increase. Um, so th that poses a great opportunity for advertisers um, when that happens. And, uh, you know, sadly, I think with employment cuts, um, with, or pay cuts, sorry, I should say, and employment cuts, I, I think people will start to watch their money a little bit more. They won't necessarily be going out even when things do open up. Um, they perhaps will have the habit of sitting at home and, and watching more content. So it's a, it's a great space that I guess COVID to a positive has probably pushed the space along. Uh, now we just need to see the advertisers invest. And, and we're seeing that a little bit, but we need to see some more there probably. Yeah, I, I think I couldn't agree more. I think when I think back a little to uh, 2008, I think was an inflection point around programmatic and shift of money to programmatic. Uh, I think this could be an inf uh, interesting inflection point with that movement of uh, viewership and revenue through to OTT uh, as a result. So interesting to see how that goes. John, from a um, media planning perspective, uh, just wondering how this is perhaps, uh, if you've seen some changes in buyer trends yeah. uh, and how big a part programmatic OTT plays in your current media plans. So it should be no surprises that we've seen a drop in outdoor and cinema for the reasons that Laura just mentioned. I think what's interesting is that we've seen quite a bit, bit of that investment um, go back into broadcast linear television. Um, and we've seen a couple of markets across APAC where broadcast TV has actually increased in terms of its share of the media plan by one or two points. Digital has sort of held its share. So I thought that was quite an interesting insight that advertisers have opted for um, to move budgets into linear television. Um, moving from outdoor and cinema. And I think that's due to the fact that, like, there has been a spike in OTT, but there has been a spike in linear television, and that's made some, allowed for some great deals in market, as well as the fact that clients already have a lot of existing creative that are purpose-built for, for linear television, which means they can get the creative out the door. Um, so I thought that was interesting that linear television, it's even increased its share. Um, mm. In terms of programmatic OTT, uh, part of it. Yes, it's it's definitely becoming more part of the programmatic schedule. Um, I think it's been what's happened over the last couple of months is we've seen spikes in uh, infantry from some of the key broadcasters, which has allowed us to 
potentially spend a little bit more on the premium OTT environments rather than potentially the in-app gaming environments that uh, historically we spend across. So those are the insights that we've seen. Right. Yeah, I, th I think it's quite fascinating that slight shift back to linear TV. I think that's that's quite amazing. There are yeah. examples like we have a, like a, a really interesting example category is um, I guess quick service restaurants. We've actually seen that as a category move money from linear into addressable OTT because they're all been promoting uh, home delivery services. Mm -hmm. So therefore, addressable uh, TV allows them to be a bit clever with their messaging when it comes to that. So there are there are examples of categories which have uh, taken advantage of OTT. But as I said, broadly speaking, we've seen across the board clients move back into linear television. Hmm, fascinating. Again, it'd be great to see what happens, I think, six to eight months' time. Uh, does that continue, or do we start seeing this sort of flood back? I know what I've heard as well, uh, and you may know more than me, but it's uh, around uh, linear TV uh, rates have been depressed significantly as well, and that's sometimes made it even more attractive than perhaps it was uh, eight to 12 months ago because of that depression in rates. So um, I don't know if that's another reason, perhaps, of that shift back. Yeah, li we have seen, obviously, um, deflation in the market, and there's no doubt about it that linear sales salespeople are very, very good at being able to get that out to market quickly and evangelizing their offers in the market. Mm. Okay, great. Um, th looking at the US, a lot of uh, media coverage, uh, upfronts being cancelled, um, a lot more spot buying in the market. I think uh, market is just very worried about committing the huge sums of money which they do uh, to those upfronts in the US. Uh, but many of them cancelled, sort of a lot of press around that. Matt, just wondering from your perspective, uh, you know, what, does this have implications uh, for the local o OTT market um, or is, th is there any implication for our market here? Well, um the, uh, we don't really have upfronts in the market, so I'd, I'd, I'd say, and also if it came to an upfronts question, that's probably something that uh, that, that John would be uh, better suited. I, I think that one of the problems that we've got is that we that we're, we've still got uh, a, a very nascent state of the uh, advertising players in the in the OTT market. Um, in the subscription market, there are there are big players already. I mean. Um, the size of Netflix and stuff like that, but there's still a lot of fracture. And one of the um, big advantages that the US market has had is that they had all of these broadcasters come together under Hulu mm -hmm. um, and give one venue which was able to give the scale and, and give the shape to the market. And mm -hmm. I think that because we're still in quite a fractured state, uh, we're still developing you know, from a very nascent beginning in the OTT markets. I think that um, you know, we, we need sort of an event or we need some, some more consolidation to bring us a product um, mm -hmm. like a Hulu to be able to drive us uh, mm -hmm. forward. And uh, you know, Hulu has its own upfronts and stuff like that, even though I believe they're cancelled for this year. Um, so we're, we're moving, we've got to move past the nascent state that we're in today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, that fractured market uh, is something that uh, will continue to, I think, inhibit growth in Southeast Asia. It's one of the real challenges we need to come over, such cultural diversity, geographic diversity. I think it's really hard to get that huge reach across all of these markets. Um, so um, I know that'll, that'll hopefully solve itself in time. Um, okay, so let's move on to header bidding, something uh, very close to my heart. Uh, many of you may be aware PubMatic launched our OTT header bidding product uh, just about two weeks ago. Uh, so we are hoping it's going to overcome many of these challenges um, that we've been speaking about today. Um, you know, header bidding has been around for uh, many years now uh, on desktop uh, for a long time. It's sort of moved into mobile a little. And now very recently, uh, it's starting to move uh, into the OTT um, world as well. So perhaps, Laura, I'd be interested um, starting with you and having a think about those uh, broader benefits um, of header bidding and perhaps how you see this impacting the OTT side of things and your sort of views around that. Apologies. So I guess some of the initial uh, benefits uh, of header bidding are things like higher fill rates, um, a higher cost for the publisher, kind of more uh, transparency and view into that waterfall. Uh, the inventory has higher value. So there's a lot more, I guess, 
buying flexibility um, that's allowed from header bidding um, or given because of header bidding. What I will say is, you know, there's some challenges as well there. Uh, but for the most part, header bidding is is a huge advancement, um, which has been around for a while, as you said. Um, when it comes to the OTT space, I guess, you know, it's still really, really early days for OTT. We've heard today, you know, from John that there's still a long way to go in terms of investment. So I think this is a great step in the right direction. And if all of those positives and the buying efficiencies um, are applied to OTT, then it's only a great natural step um, that we, you know, that we should be looking and publishers should be looking to invest in. Um, so yeah, I think we'll see, and it's great to hear PubMedica are invested in this, but we'll see this, this huge shift um, and, and change, which is good for the industry. Okay, great. Matt, from the DSP's perspective, uh, I know that you are generally uh, a lover of header bidding. I uh, wonder what your thoughts are around this moving into the OTT market. Yeah, well, well header bidding just gives a better marketplace quality. Um, just types of inventory and things like that that might have been trapped into subscription deals or um, yeah, sponsorship deals. Um, yeah, that, that there's a chance for people to be able to bid on that inventory that otherwise might have been locked away, which gives a, a much better overall quality to the marketplace. So I, I think that um, that moving into the television market is, is something that's going to really help the marketplace quality move, move forward. Great. Good to hear. Uh, John, anything from you from the agency buying side, buying across many platforms, uh, how do you see header bidding and it moving into, or perhaps uh, for a moment, uh, sort of traditionally view on header bidding and then you know, its movement into OTT and the impact? Yeah, for in the display, we've seen huge advantages of header bidding, um, getting better access to infantry to deliver better outcomes for clients. I guess the theory of header bidding OTT, getting better access to broadcaster infantry, Sounds gr seems great to us, and we would hopefully that will uh, re result in better targeting for us, but also our ability to spend more with premium broadcasters. And some of the tests we've seen in Australia with header bidding, we do see that we're our ability to spend a little bit more with broadcasters. So the, the theory stacks up, but look, trying to scale it will be the next big thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, phew, I'm glad to hear everyone's supportive of that. Otherwise, <laughs> I would have been a little nervous about our product launch, uh, but all good. But uh, certainly one thing that um, I have learned is uh, the OTT market is so significantly different. Sorry, the OTT uh, technology is so different. Uh, when you have a look at display and even uh, in-app and SDK, uh, there's complexity around that. But from a technology company's perspective, when we look at migrating header bidding from display and SDKs in-app through to OTT, very, very different things. We're dealing with like ad podding, uh, server-side ad insertion, huge amount of complexity. So my view is uh, it is probably going to be a curve that will be uh, perhaps slightly slower, uh, just in the sense that there's quite a lot of uh, innovation that's going to be needed to really get us ramping and up at full speed uh, for OTT header bidding. Uh, but pleased to see generally that everyone uh, is supportive of it. Uh, that's fantastic. I'll go back and tell the CEO. Um, I've got a question here uh, for Laura. Um, this is a send-in question. So, Laura, uh, what is the future of programmatic buying for OTT uh, as there are many unknown devices and connected devices in the market apart from mobile? So I assume this might be alluding to the measurement piece because uh, they're asking there's many Sorry, unknown you? devices and connected devices in the market apart from mobile. So how does this affect the future of programmatic buying is the way I'm seeing that question. Did you get that? Sorry, so to reinterpret that, the, the question uh, is the question around uh, the, sorry, ask, ask that again. Yeah, I'm just trying to again. break down that question. Yeah, so what is the future of programmatic buying uh, for OTT um, as there are many mm -hmm. unknown devices and connected devices apart from mobile? So I think this was following your measurement question. So I think they're saying if there's many unknown devices, um, you know, how does that impact the future of programmatic buying? Yeah, sure. So I, th I think like anything, I mean, programmatic is the future. I think it, depending on where you are in, in different marketplaces, um, maybe you're just at the start of that programmatic journey, but programmatic has multiple benefits um, all around, you know, basically improving efficiency um, and, and automation, I guess, of, of digital buying. So while there are some challenges in the OTT space, um, I foresee that uh, much like PubMatic have kind of called out today, that some of this inventory will be made available. It just might mean that I guess there's a lag in the availability 
availability of this inventory as people kind of take their time um, uh, to, to put, I guess, their inventory into the space. Uh, but I do see it as, as the future. Um, there'll always be, I guess, some measurement challenges, but yeah, it goes back to John's point around uh, maybe we just need to make this a little bit simpler. Maybe we're overcomplicating things. If we look at how TV is traditionally bought today, um, it's very simple. Um, so maybe we're, we're overcomplicating. But yeah, in short, uh, I continue to see lots of investment in programmatic and in these emerging technologies. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, um, I think that does, yeah. I know to your point, I think, you know, measurement uh, is so key in uh, building confidence as well, I think, in the market and going into these new areas like OTT. I think the work that you're going to be doing at uh, IES is going to be hugely valued, I think, uh, by all buyers uh, and consumers in the market. Okay, um, getting on to the final question um, and uh, looking to the future, uh, the future of OTT buying. Um, and thinking about the tech vendors, uh, people you know like the Trade Desk, like Podmatic, like Integral Ad Science, and what part we have to play um, in the ecosystem, uh, and perhaps uh, keep it, keep it going with you, Laura, and uh, have a little bit of a th uh, you know. Can you tell us a little bit about what IAS is doing um, around the future and improvement of the ecosystem for OTT? Perfect. Yeah, ladies first. I love it. Um, so I guess there's a couple of things we're doing. Um, the first is, you know, w there's plenty of uh, plenty of bad actors as these new evolving uh, evolving technologies come into play. So the traditional foundation that IS has been built on around ensuring that when agencies or brands are buying quality, um, that same thing applies here to the OTT space. So making sure that we're mitigating the fraud uh, and that we're putting uh, the ads in viewable spaces, which is, you know, most of the time at CTV, it's obvious that it should be there. Uh, and then there's future capability around brand safety. But what we're really looking to do is, I guess, work with some of those governing bodies to, to build out the measurement, build out the standardization, uh, and look at things like potentially time and view as a metric for measurement. Um, so yeah, the standardi standardization and the measurement is key for us. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, we're really excited about the space and uh, building the technology for that. Great, yeah, and uh, I'll agree with your point on those neutral bodies as well. I think um, you know have a great part to play in this, be it Avia, the uh, IAB, et cetera. I think they could have a great part in, in playing, um, you know, improving the ecosystem. Uh, Matt, what is uh, the Trade Desk doing uh, around improving the OTT ecosystem? Well, I think that the consumer trend for uh, for consumption of media is is really very clear. The the future is going to be streamed television, um, and Trade Desk. You know, years ago started to to put together, um, you know, the, the 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 approach that we'll be taking, and I think that in many ways we've sort of thought of digital advertising as being a dress rehearsal for the future, which will be a, a streamed television future. Um, so it, it's something that we've been investing in for a long period of time. It's something that we've got a huge belief in uh, as a business, and and something that yeah, personally I also believe that there's there is no. Um, future that's not going to be everybody wanting all of their content on demand. Absolutely, and you just need to look at those kids, uh, Mike. <laughs> when they when they grow up, all they're doing nowadays is staring at those screens. So uh, when they hit our age and start spending money, I think it's only going to improve. Uh, finally, over to you, John. What do you think uh, us technology players can do to improve uh, the OTT ecosystem? Oh, what technology providers can do provide? Um. I thought you were going to ask me what Group M were doing to try and do it. You can answer okay. that as well. Shameless, right. shameless, <laughs> shameless plug here. Uh, but Group M will be launching Finecast, which is our addressable TV platform um, in APAC. Um, to try and, I guess our overall view at Group M is, is that we probably aren't taking advantage as much as we'd like of some of the great OTT providers out there across the various markets. And uh, in, to try and address that, we'll be launching Finecast. Um, we're already live in Finecast in UK, Australia, and Canada. We'll launch Finecast in Indonesia next month and across a number of other markets. And that will be, a cre that'll be creating a, a addressable TV marketplace um, using technology vendors to help enable that, allowing clients to do household level targeting. And we think that will be a really good solution for our clients. And it sort of simplifies it and probably takes it away from some of the over measurable digital metrics that we have at the minute. So like I said, shameless plug, but that mm -hmm. will be our um, solution to try and build the OTT ecosystem. Okay, sounds fascinating. Uh, yeah, let's chat about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I have another writing question. So uh, I think I can throw this out uh, to anyone who's uh, brave enough to put their hand up first. So um, are the only limitations to significant movement of budget 
to premium video or OTT, scale and buying efficiency. So our scale and buying efficiency are the only limitations. What do you guys think? Anything else besides scale and buying efficiency? Uh, I think scale's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's enough volume out there. Mm -hmm. it depends what define, I guess, the definition of efficiency is. Like, is it price? I mean, uh, like back to my previous earlier point, you know, UGC content is always going to be probably slightly cheaper than premium content. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the barriers is trying to value this stuff and price it appropriately um, is, it, is a current barrier. Like I said, it intuitively feels better to be in Game of Thrones and dogs on skateboards, but by how much? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think my view on that is besides um, scale and efficiency is probably measurement. Uh, I think that's probably one of the other mm. things that's inhibiting the movement of, uh, of that advertising revenue across. But our time is up, unfortunately. Um, so I just want to uh, thank Avia for the invitation from a Pubmatic perspective. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you to uh, our panel as well, to Matt, to John, to Laura. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, fantastic being here. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jason, Laura, John, and Matt, um, for a great session. So Laura mentioned in that session how long it took to form a habit, and she mentioned 30 days. And this seems to be becoming a bit of a recurring theme uh, for this OTT Virtual Summit, because when Anthony Dobson kicked things off um, on Monday morning, which seems a long time ago now, uh, he referred to the study which talked about 66 days to form a habit. Um, and it's come up uh, from a number of our other speakers. And so, um, and I have to credit Charmaine Kwan here, who did, sort of did a little bit of research. So the, the history of how long it takes to form a habit, if you'll indulge me just for a minute, is that it goes back to the 1950s in America with a plastic surgeon called Maxwell Maltz. Now, he discovered that after plastic surgery, when you looked in the mirror with your new nose or your new jawline or whatever it may be, it took 21 days for you to get used to it. Um, and similarly, people who had had amputations discovered that it took 21 days for that phantom limb feeling to disappear. And he went on apparently to write a book which sold 3 million copies and, and made him, I think, a lot more money from, from the book than it did from plastic surgery. Um, about 21 days being the standard for forming a habit move on to I think 2009 um, and a, a big study from uh, done from out of UCL in London uh, where they sort of had a, a big panel of people and they got them to try and do something new they came up with the 66 days and that's what Anthony was referring to um, and they, they discovered that yes it, it actually it, it's harder to form a new habit and it took 66 days but I think the the theme that we're getting from this uh, seminar and I guess sort of harking back to sort of Laura's 30 days is that COVID changes all of that all over again. I mean with with our behavior sort of so completely changed and sort of being locked down that the assumption is that those habit forming um, uh, issues take a, a far shorter amount of time. So maybe it's not 66 days now, maybe it is much closer to the 30 that Laura referenced. Um, but whatever it is, uh, and if you've got opinions on this, sorry, there, there's, there's a chat group. Um, please feel free to tell us what you, uh, or, or you personally, how long it takes for you to form a habit. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the moral of the story is the OTT habit, um, the streaming video habit is very much here to stay. So um, just before we sort of tee up the next thing, again, for anybody who's new to um, these seminars, 
just in terms of how you navigate your way around, and the way to think about it is right now you are in the equivalent of the ballroom. Um, with the stage, you're looking at the speakers. Um, but there's another part of the virtual summit, which is outside of the ballroom. That's where you go for the coffee break and where you sort of catch up with friends. So we have the virtual equivalent of that as well. And we do encourage you after this to sort of make use of that. So that's the place where there are exhibition booths. Um, and Pubmatic have got a, a great virtual booth there. Um, you can set up meetings with them on the exhibitor page as well. So I, I would encourage you to explore that. We have a number of other exhibitors. There are meeting rooms. Um, you can have uh, impromptu meetings with, with people who are there as well. But don't go and do that just now. Um, but once the, the, the good stuff is finished, once the video is over, uh, please do take a moment to go and do that. So. In a moment, we're going to welcome Ranji David, Director of Asia Pacific for Marketing Services for the World Federation of Advertisers, and her panelists, who they're going to share their thoughts on advertising versus COVID-19. But just before that, we're going to play the fourth and final installment of our Gen Z, Gen Z, depending on your preference, Speaks videos. So again, for anybody who hasn't seen these, um, we know that Okay, millennials are the future, but Gen Z even more are, are the future. And as we look to what the future of streaming video is going to be, we have to understand what the habits and the behavior, the likes and the dislikes of Gen Z are. So this is a series of videos that we put together. Um, they're, they're, they're really fun. They're very short. Um, and thanks to NUS for the help in, in producing these. Um, but this is what some Gen Z from Singapore think about the future, well, think about the present of OTT for them. I watch ads any day. Watch ads in the video, because I don't use it that much, so I don't mind. It depends, right? Like, like I wouldn't pay for YouTube. But like, I would pay for Netflix because like Netflix is like proper shows, I guess. Yeah, same. I rather because I think it's videos. It's not only just shows that you can watch. It's also like movies and stuff. And you can't find movies any other platform. So I rather much pay for Netflix. Yeah. If the ads are before the video, I'm okay. So I wouldn't pay the subscription. But if there are a lot of ads during the video, it's quite disruptive. So then if the subscription was a very small amount of money, then yes, I would pay. I'm fine with watching ads because it's only at most 30 seconds, so I can deal with that. No, now YouTube got double ad. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's yeah. annoying. Actually, I like to watch ads. <laughs> sometimes there are some ads that are very entertaining. But what I feel is that like sometimes the ads are interesting, but the first three seconds are not interesting enough. So they lose a lot of viewers, even though the ad can actually be quite interesting. At most fifteen dollars a month. Fifteen is the max. Fifteen a month. Probably around fifteen. For the ad free, yeah. um, I would pay five dollars for a lifetime. At this point, at this point where I'm not earning any income. Yeah. <laughs> 